Let's unite our hearts together, please, in a word of prayer. Let's all pray. Our gracious, eternal, loving, heavenly Father, we do thank Thee again for this, the return of Thy day. We praise Thee, Lord, for the first day of the week, in which we can meet in a fashion such as this to worship and to praise Thee, our living God. And, O oh, Father, we pray at the outset that Thou would be one of our number. And Lord, that our worship might be in, in spirit and in truth, and it might be acceptable in thy sight. And Lord, we pray that each soul might be conscious that God is here. Oh, hear our prayer. Abide with us. Do us good. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 105, and it's on page 99. We'll stand to sing the first seven verses, please. Give thanks to God. Call on his name. To men his deeds make known. Sing ye to him. Sing psalms, proclaim his wondrous works, each one. Psalm 105, let's stand and sing verses 1 to 7.
Let's further unite our hearts together in a word of prayer. Let's seek the Lord afresh this morning. Let's all pray. Our gracious, eternal, loving, heavenly Father, we do continue in thy presence this morning in the Savior's precious and all-worthy name. We thank the Lord that thou art almighty God alone, as we've been singing about. And, O God, we can think and we can consider all the wondrous works that thou hast done. We thank the Lord that thou art the great creator of the heavens and the earth. And all things were spake to being out of nothing in the space of six days, and all was very good. And Lord, we praise thee today that thou art the God of salvation. And we thank the Lord for thy great and wonderful plan of redemption, even from eternity past, in that thou didst decree and one day when the fullness of time was come, God would send forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem them that were under the law. And Lord, we thank thee today for the perfect obedience of Christ. We praise thee for that day when he came down to the scene of time, born of that virgin, to walk amongst men, the sinless, spotless lamb. And oh God, one day to ascend Golgotha's brow where he would lay down his life for sinners and rebels such as we. And we thank thee today that this Sabbath, as every Sabbath, reminds us that the cross is now empty. The tomb has been vacated and the throne is occupied. Thank the Lord up from the grave he arose, triumphant o'er his foes. And we worship one who's alive forevermore the one who is seated at the Father's right hand. For this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin forever, sat down at the right hand of God. And Lord, we come to give our worship, to bring our adoration unto Thee, the triune God, the only true and living God of heaven and earth. Thank the Lord for this house. Praise the Lord for the doors open for the preaching of the whole counsel of God. Thank the Lord for each soul that's gathered even in the house of God today. And Lord, we acknowledge thy goodness toward us in the week that is past. Thou hast preserved us in our goings out and in our comings in. And Lord, we have, thou hast brought us again to this hour in which we can worship thee. We remember, Lord, those maybe outside, remember, Lord, also those in the neighboring district. And, oh, Father, we thank the Lord uh, for the neighbors around about. They have an opportunity to hear thy word. Do so again. We pray, Lord, it might be a blessing. and It might be a challenge even to every heart that would hear it. And our prayer would be, Lord, that thou might, O oh God, visit money slain in salvation power. And, Lord, that we might hear of the news of this one and that one, being born again of thy spirit. And Lord, of that day where God came down, and Lord, we pray that it might be noised abroad of what the Lord is doing. Lord, we recognize there's so much talk about other things. But, oh, Father, we pray that our conversation might be of the Lord in these days. We pray for our province today and all its need. We pray, oh, God, for our denomination, our churches here, there, and yonder. We ask, O oh God, it might be a day of rich blessing as the word of God goes forth. Thank the Lord, we have the promise. It'll not return unto thee void, but it shall accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing whereto thou hast sent it. And Father, we pray that thou might, Lord, bless thy word up and down our land today. Oh, that might be a day where the angels in heaven be rejoicing over souls uh, having repented and know God's salvation. And we ask that thou might favor our land again. Oh God, forgive us for the sin that has come in. Forgive us for the sin that lies at our door. And we pray, oh God, that thou might, uh, Lord, forgive us for the desecration of the Sabbath in these days and other things, Lord, that would grieve the Spirit of God. And we pray that thou might, Lord, in wrath, remember mercy. Thou might come again, and thou might, Lord, have mercy upon our nation at large. And, Lord, the sight of Ireland as well. 
And O oh God, we cry to thee that God might arise, and Lord, that many souls might seek and find thee as Lord, as King, as Savior of their life. Hear our cry today. Remember the boys and girls. We thank thee for the Sabbath school already convened. Thank thee for our young people, for those in the Bible class, for those in the prayer meeting. Lord, we praise thee for them. And we pray that thou would lead them on with thyself. Thou would do a work amongst our youth, O God, that this generation might set their hope on God. And we pray that thou would, Lord, move across our land among our young people in these days. We ask for our elderly. And Lord, no doubt there are those that would love to be here today but cannot. And we ask that they might know a little portion of thy blessing even in their own homes today. Lord, meet with them. Lord, help them to rest in those eternal promises that are yea and amen in Christ Jesus. Remember any that sickly, put thine hand upon them as the great physician. And we pray that thou would raise them up again to health and strength. O oh God, we look to thee for not only money slain, but right across our, our land. We think of the missionary endeavors across the globe. And we ask, O oh God, thou might encourage even laborers on the field. And Lord, we pray thou would give them fruit for their labor, whether it's on the home front or the foreign mission field. And Lord, we pray that we might hear good news of what God is doing. So Father, we do look to thee. We do remember the land of Ukraine today. Remember the church of Jesus Christ there. We pray that thou would guard, that thou might protect, that thou might strengthen. And, O oh God, thou would frustrate the plans of the enemy that has come in. And, Lord, we pray that, O oh God, thou might turn them one against another. And the insurgency would def be defeated. And, Lord, that thou would have honor and glory even at this time. O oh Father, answer prayer. Liberate that people again. There's others that need thy touch as well. And we pray that thou would do it even for Jesus' sake. Father, hear our cry. Abide with us. Bless as we come to the Scriptures. Help us to give consideration to them. And Lord, we pray especially for the preaching of thy word. That Lord, it might go forth in the power and demonstration of the Holy Spirit. Remember thy servant that ministers here week after week. We thank thee for him. We pray, Lord, that thou would refresh him in body and soul and mind at this time of vacation. And thou would watch over him in his goings out and his comings in. And Lord, that thou would bring him back refreshed, even for the work of God in this part of the vineyard. Remember the session? Remember the committee? Lord, undertake for each, we pray, in uh, oversight of the congregation. And we pray that they might know the wisdom and the direction of God, even every step of the way. Hear our cry. Abide with us, for we ask these things in our Savior's precious and worthy name. Amen. Ephesians chapter, sorry, Exodus chapter 5. <clears throat> We're turning to Exodus chapter 5, and we want to read some of the opening uh, verses, please, from this chapter. You'll know, of course, that chapter 3 is where the Lord met with Moses at the burning bush and commissioned him for the work that he had for him. Well, chapter 5, he's back in the land of Egypt and he's standing before Pharaoh. Chapter 5 then, verse 1. And afterward Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. And they said, The God of the Hebrews hath met with us. Let us go, we pray thee, three days' journey into the desert and sacrifice unto the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. And the king of Egypt said unto them, Wherefore do ye, Moses and Aaron, let the people from their works get you unto your burdens? And Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land now are many, and ye make them rest from their burdens. And Pharaoh commanded the same day the taskmasters 
of the people and their officers, saying, Ye shall no more give the people straw to make brick as heretofore. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. And the tail of the bricks, which they did make heretofore, ye shall lay upon them. Ye shall not diminish aught thereof, for they be idle. Therefore they cry, saying, Let us go and sacrifice to our God. Let their more work be laid upon the men, that they may labor therein. And let them not regard vain words. And the taskmasters of the people went out, and their officers, and they spake to the people, saying, Thus saith Pharaoh, I will not give you straw. Go ye, get you straw where ye can find it, yet not aught of your work shall be diminished. So the people were scattered abroad throughout all the land of Egypt to gather stubble instead of straw. And the taskmasters hasted them, saying, Fulfill your works, your daily tasks, as when there was straw. The officers of the children of Israel, which Pharaoh's taskmasters had set over them, were beaten and demanded, Wherefore have ye not fulfilled your task in making brick both yesterday and today as heretofore? Amen. Just ending a reading at the end of verse 14. And we know the Lord himself will add his own divine blessing upon the reading of his precious word. We'll ask our brother Billy to come and give the necessary announcements for the incoming week, please. Well, let me first of all give you all a very warm welcome to our service today in the Saviour's name. If you're visiting with us, we bid you special welcome again, trusting that the Lord will bless you as you meet with us here around the word of the Lord. We want to give a special welcome to our visiting preacher today, the Reverend Andrew Patterson. We have happy memories of his time with us during our vacancy. And we welcome you again to the Patterson in the Saviour's name. And we trust God will bless you today and us through you as we hear the word of the Lord. The gospel service is this evening at half, at seven o'clock, preceded by the time of prayer at half past six. And the Reverend Patterson will be with us again for the gospel service. Wednesday at eight o'clock is the Bible study and prayer meeting and the Reverend Julian Patterson will be alone to conduct the prayer meeting on Wednesday evening. Thursday, the Gospel Bus plan meeting, Planning Meeting for the workers is at half past seven. So workers, remember that, please. And then on Friday night, the Youth Fellowship, eight o'clock, the Reverend Paul Hanna will be alone, and his topic is the 18 and 59 revival. Friday night is also the late night men's prayer meeting, and it's from 10 o'clock to 11 p.m. Service is next Lord's Day, Sabbath school and Bible class, 10.45, morning worship, 12 noon, preceded by prayer at half past 11, and then the evening gospel service at 7, with the time of prayer at half past 6, and the preacher will be the Reverend David Crean. Today, being the last in the month, it is the maintenance fund offering, And then next, Lord's Day being the first, it is the retiring missionary offering. One or two other announcements here. There is a mission board conference to be held in Lisbon Free Presbyterian Church from Saturday the 7th of May through to Saturday the 14th. There's different speakers and uh, there are leaflets, or we cards as you leave in the church and the vestibule, and you can take one, and it gives you all the information there without me going into any further detail. So do, if you're interested, take a wee card with you as you leave. Uh, for those who have put their names down for the first aid course, which, that will be held on Saturday, the 4th of June, in the church hall here from 9.30am 
to 4.30 p.m. That's Saturday, the 4th of June, in the church hall, 9.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. for those who have their names down for the first aid course. <clears throat> Do remember to pray for the recommencement of the Gospel Bus Children's Meetings. They'll be restarting on Tuesday the 3rd of May at 7 o'clock. And if you know boys and girls that would be able to come, then you could get in contact and get them along if possible. We'd ask you to continue to pray for the sick and those who are shut in and the bereaved in these times. Do remember especially those that still feel the loss of loved ones. Continue to pray that God will bless them and fill that vacant chair in this time. I think these are all the necessary announcements at this time. I do want to thank Brother Sturt for words of welcome. It's always good to be back in a money slaying. And uh, it's always good to uh, hear of the Lord's blessing. And uh, as you would know, uh, your minister and myself, we uh, meet up at times. Um, we're in often uh, uh, each other's company or on the phone uh, throughout every week. And uh, um, my wife thinks I have another son, uh, really, in some time, some cases. Uh, but it's good to have fellowship with him, and the Lord uh, trust will bless him even at this time. It's good to be back. Uh, we look forward to the Lord's blessing today. And do your best to be back out again tonight. Bring others with you if you can. And seek the Lord uh, for his blessing upon our meetings. Number 44 will ch change your position. And we'll sing this before we come uh, to the preaching of God's word. Mighty God, while angels bless thee, may immortals sing thy name, Lord of men as well as angels. Thou art every creature's theme. Page 193, number 44. And we'll stand as we uh, worship the Lord again, please.
invite you back to Exodus chapter 5, that passage that we read earlier on. We've entitled the message, The Battle for for Worship. The Battle for Worship. Let's just unite our hearts together in a short word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank thee again for thy presence with us already this morning. Lord, I was promised where the two or three are gathered together in my name. There am I in the midst of them. Lord, we desire that that presence of the Lord might intensify Even, Lord, as we come to the uh, consideration of thy word, we pray that thy spirit will be poured out upon us. Give us understanding. O God, give us, Lord, teachable spirits. We pray, Lord, I would take away every distraction. Close us in with thyself. We plead the covering of the precious blood. And, Lord, indeed, that thy word would run and be glorified. O God, to that end, I pray, thou would give help in the pew. But, Lord, thou would also give help in the pulpit. Lord, give me words that must and shall prevail. Give us those prevailing words. And we pray, Lord, that thou might be glorified in all that will be said and done. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In this day in which we live, with technological advances, people expect things to run smoothly, coherently, and on time. That is the expectation. But of course, we know that's not how things always are. Because there's many a stoppage, there's many a disruption along the way. You know, men and women, that misguided conception or mentality is also how many believers think that the Christian life ought to be. And when things don't go like that, because there are the discouragements and there are the setbacks. Then the doubts start to form and there's the wondering, what have we done wrong? Why is things not running smoothly? And dear people, when Moses returned to the land of Egypt, that's exactly how it was for him. That's exactly how it was. He had been hesitant in obeying the will of God for his life. He had offered excuse after excuse of not going back to the land of Egypt. Nevertheless, it didn't change the mind nor the will of God for him. And he was bidden to go back. And he was bidden to stand before Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. And now the real task and the real battle has just begun. And we ought not to be surprised of what we have read at the start of this chapter 5. Because not only had God already intimated to Moses that Pharaoh's heart would be hardened. And we read in chapter 3, I think it's verse 19, he said to him, I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go. God had already told Moses that. But dear people, when we step back, And when we analyze what God's purpose in all of this was, then there should be no surprise what happens. For his divine plan was to deliver the nation of his people from the bondage of Egypt. But that redemptive process would not go unchallenged, as neither it would be for God's redemption for his own people where that was concerned, and the giving of Christ as the only Redeemer. But just remember this, that although there would be the opposition, yet these things would not frustrate, they would not overflow the divine purpose of God. Deliverance would be granted, not because of Moses, not because of the strength or the numbers of the people, but deliverance would be realized by God's great strength. And you know, if you go forward a few chapters, that's what Israel were to remember. Chapter 13 of Exodus and verse 3, they are reminded. Moses said unto the people, Remember this day in which he came out from Egypt, out of the house of bondage, for by strength of hand the Lord brought you out from this place. The Lord brought you out from this place. When we come to look at these verses, It might be beneficial 
to remember what the Savior himself taught. In Mark 3, verse 27, I just want to read it to you. He said, No man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he will first bind the strong man. And then he will spoil his house. And dear people, that essentially is what has been illustrated for us in chapter 5 of Exodus and the, and the chapters that follow. Because God is entering the strong man's house. He's going to be bound. His goods and his house will be spoiled. And our foremost thought will no doubt be, we're no match for the strong man. Because as we look at Pharaoh here, in a sense, in many ways, he typifies Satan. The battle lines are drawn. It's the forces of evil against the forces of righteousness. It's Pharaoh who resembles the God of this world against God and his servants who wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. You see, men and women, ultimately, this is a battle for worship. And that battle's going on today. There's a battle going on for worship. I want you to see, firstly, here, the request. Pharaoh, as any king, would receive many requests every day of his life but none like the request that he hears from the lips of Moses as he stands before him is brought out to us in the words of verse 1. And afterward Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. And as you look at that, then the source of that request cannot be passed over. This wasn't a case of merely Moses and Aaron merely standing in the precincts of the palace and presenting their cause. They had a word from God. The request was from the Lord. And so we hear the first words from before this ungodly, defiant king. The first words are what? Thus saith the Lord. Thus saith Jehovah. The God of the Israelites were commanding his people to worship. And those words set this apart from any words of a mere mortal. Now while Pharaoh could appreciate the call to worship. There's nothing strange in that. Yet he did not understand the message that way. And he didn't receive it as a word from God. You see that? Thus saith the Lord. Mark it. Moses and Aaron, picture it in your own mind's eye, standing before this king, and the first words that come to him, thus saith the Lord. There's people today who are just the same as Pharaoh. That doesn't change the message in the slightest. You see, men and women, this book is still thus, saith the Lord. We're not preaching some man's notion here today or, or man's ideology. It's thus, saith the Lord. What saith the Scriptures? It is the Word of God that liveth and abideth forever, that has within it power to accomplish what God chooses to to accomplish. When the Lord created this world, he spake it into being. It was by the word of his power. He said, let there be light, and there was light. And you know, Isaiah 55, and the word of verse 11, reminds us that his word shall not return unto him void. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I have sent it. And Isaiah the prophet illustrates that in the previous verses, just as if the, as the rain comes down and the snow comes down from heavens, it doesn't return to him again. But it does its work. It has its purpose. And so the word that goeth forth out of his mouth will be as the same. You know, men and women, what an encouragement that is when we speak a little word in season. What an encouragement for the gospel bus team about to embark on a new uh, term with the boys and girls. What a, a word of encouragement that is for any prospective missions that, that are planned. It is that the outcome of it is in God's hand. It might not always be what we anticipate. But God has promised to bless his word. And you remember that. 
God has promised to bless his word. And the message to Pharaoh was from the Lord. There's a significance about this message and this request. It was going to affect the welfare of all of Egypt. It would determine the future of the land. It would expose the evil nature of Pharaoh. But Pharaoh nor any in the palace that day would understand or consider its significance. They didn't realize that when Moses and Aaron walked into the presence of Pharaoh that it would have far-reaching consequences. And Egypt in due time would suffer the greatest assault that the land had ever experienced. In due time the news would be of the devastation, of the havoc, caused in the land. There will be the dreaded news of every firstborn in every home on that one night now dead. And it would also be the case. The news would soon filter out that the king and his armies were drowned in the Red Sea. The significance of the message, it was a time for judgment. As Israel had been terribly mistreated by Pharaoh, And now God was rising to their aid. But none of them, not even Pharaoh himself, saw in the request presented anything of great significance. But when man rebels and when man resists God for a long time, then judgment without warning must follow. God must judge sin. The significance of this request is that it had to do with worship. Look at verse 1 again. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, let my people go that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. That's what is meant by those words. The request was reasonable. It couldn't be rejected because it was too demanding or too unusual. The practice of the Egyptians was to worship their gods. Worship was something that was important to them. Pharaoh was not an irreligious person. In fact, he may have even considered himself to be a god. But it becomes clear that this request was not considered as reasonable to Pharaoh. For any request from the true and living God is often too much for the flesh. And the battle is between Pharaoh and his gods and Jehovah, the only true and living God of his people. Do you see the seriousness of it? The seriousness can be noted in it as repeated in verse 3. And they said, The God of the Hebrews hath met with us. Let us go, we pray thee, three days journey into the desert and sacrifice unto the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. It was clear. And Moses and Aaron weren't just going to walk away. They were determined. They were going to be, they weren't going to be easily turned aside by Pharaoh. And that become even more obvious in the coming months. And in the Lord's work, men and women, determination is an important aspect if we are to serve the Lord in an acceptable manner. If we lack a t- determination, then the first hurdle or the first difficulty will mean desertion from our post. Moses would have many a setback standing before Pharaoh. And without determination, he wouldn't have lasted that first day. Now, determination. I wonder, do you have it? It comes in different forms, you know. Conviction is determination with belief. Faithfulness is determination to do that which is right. Courage is determination in the face of trouble and adversity. This was a serious request that Moses was making before Pharaoh. And it brings to the fore, does it not? The correlation between God and Caesar. Between the church and the state. Now there are those who believe that the state has all authority. There are those who don't believe that the state has any authority at all. Only God does. Now that leads to a life of seclusion, monastic life, 
shutting themselves away from the state. That's not what God desires. Then there are others, and their view is secularism is the very opposite, for it denies God, and the only thing that exists is what we can see or what we can measure. Another view is one which recognizes God and the state as having authority, but it sees the authority of the state as dominant. Wherever there's a problem or a question, then the state rules. But whenever God is even part of that picture, then by that very definition, God has to be, have a greater authority than the estate, than the state. And the only reason why authority would be given in all matters to the state is because we're afraid to do otherwise. Can I give you an illustration of that? Pilate. Pilate three times over declared the innocence of Christ. He declared that the Lord was innocent. And yet in the end, he agreed to have him crucified. Why? I think we have the answer in John chapter 19 and verse 12. It says, And from thenceforth Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. Why did he order him to be crucified? Because he was afraid of Caesar. He was afraid of the state. The fourth view is the biblical view. It recognizes the authority of God and the authority of Caesar, but it acknowledges that the authority of God is greater and the authority of God is dominant simply because all authority comes from God. Even that which is given unto Caesar, as we have in Romans chapter 13, verse 1, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. That's important to understand. All power is given by God to those in authority over us in the state. They ought to be reminded that they're responsible to God to do the right thing. And they're accountable unto God to do the right thing. The men and women, I don't see that in the men and women that's over us. Oh, they talk about a mandate from the people. But they have a responsibility before God to do the right thing. And they're accountable to him. But you see, they're just like Pharaoh because he didn't recognize any of that. And this request. Let me show you the requirements. It can be seen that the request was put respectively. In verse 3, let us go, we pray thee. That attitude, that conduct stands, of course, in great contrast to that of Pharaoh as well, uh, as you'll see in a few moments. But we should consider not only how it was put, but also what was entailed in this respect for worship, or this request for worship. There were certain requirements that had to be met, and that for good reason. It involved particularly three different things. There was a spirit in which it was to be held. It was to be the spirit of joy. We detect that because of the word feast that is used in verse 1. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, let my people go that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. It speaks of joy. It means a a festival, an occasion of great joy. Is there any greater joy than to be liberated from bondage? That's what war-torn Ukraine longs for in these days and other countries like it. To be able to celebrate their freedom from bondage. And men and women, surely they're in as a type of the greatest joy of all. And that is the joy of having our souls set free, our souls redeemed from the bondage of our sin and from nature's darkness. There's no greater deliverance. There's no greater blessing than what Christ gives to the sinner through his redemptive work that he purchased 
on the cross of Calvary. And so it ought to be, and it ought to follow, that our worship should be joyous. We have a right to shout and sing. There should be a joy about us when we take up the hymnal. Because we're singing our praises unto the Lord. But how many don't have this real joy and they cease to worship or to come to the place of worship and they replace it with the pleasures of this world instead pleasures that only last for a season. The requirement was for the spirit in which it was held. The requirement was for sacrifice. Verse 3, the God of the Hebrews hath met with us. Let us go, we pray thee, three days journey into the desert and sacrifice unto the Lord our God. True worship centers upon the sacrifice of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ as that once for all offering for sin. You see, the animal sacrifices in the Old Testament, they were only but types and shadows. And those types, they represented the great sacrifice for sin that would be offered upon Mount Calvary. But the message was the same. And the message was without the shedding of blood, there would be no remission for sin. And it's the precious blood of Christ that cleanses us from all sin. We preach Christ and Him crucified through worship. Centers on the sacrifice. Just think that the worship of God also includes sacrifice where we are concerned. It will mean sacrifice in our time. It will mean sacrifice in our talents, our energy, our money, maybe even our friends, our popularity. But the requirement was for sacrifice. And I don't want you to miss this either. The requirement was for separation. For verse 3 tells us that the God of the Hebrews hath met with us. Let us go, we pray thee, three days journey into the desert. This worship was to take place in the wilderness or in the desert. It would be three days journey into it and that would be wise. Because the sacrifice of the lambs in the presence of the Egyptians would only be cause for disturbance. They counted the shepherd as, as an abomination. That the animals were sacrilegious. You don't touch them. And so God said to Moses, bring the message to Pharaoh, three days journey into the desert. But there surely is another point that ought to be made. And it is this, that if we are to worship God aright, then it will mean us departing from the Egypt of this world and what it represents. We cannot join with the world in worship without our worship being corrupted and polluted. We cannot worship with those who are modernists and who deny the doctrines of God's word without it compromising our stand. God was calling Israel, his people, to worship separately from the Egyptians. Three days journey. How important these requirements were I believe you can see from the closing words of verse 3 for it says, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. You see, it was worship or else judgment. Men and women, we need to understand that our worship of God is not optional. It's commanded. It's commanded for God is to be worshipped. But many miss the warning as did Pharaoh. Oh, it should have helped him to prioritize the worship of Israel because if they were smitten, if they were chastised, if they were judged for failing to worship, then he would lose his labor force. But he didn't see the requirements either. He didn't recognize them. I wonder, do we recognize those requirements for true worship today? The spirit in which we come and worship the Lord centered around the sacrifice, separated from the things of time and sense, separated from error to worship the only true and living God. Let me go on because I want you to see his refusal. The response of Pharaoh was one of utter scorn for Moses and for the children of Israel. You just consider his confession there in verse 2. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord? 
that I should obey his voice to let Israel go. I know not the Lord, neither what will I let Israel go, go. Who is the Lord? He's saying, who is Jehovah? In the authorized version, the name Lord in verse 2 is in the capitals. That tells you, Jehovah. He didn't know the God of Israel. He didn't know the one who's sovereign and ruleth over all things. Oh, he knew plenty about the idols and the false gods of Egypt, but he didn't know Almighty God, and his confession is one of ignorance. You know, there are two parts to that confession. There's the who and there's the do. Just follow it with me. He didn't know Israel's God. That's the who. Who is the Lord? And not knowing the who, he wouldn't do what Israel God said that was to be done. That I should obey. Dear people, we must know the who if the do is to follow and it is to happen. The Apostle Paul was well aware of that when he was converted. Do you remember that scene on the Damascus Road? He asked the question, Who art thou, Lord? There's the who. But then there was the other part. What wilt thou have me to do? The very moment he was converted. And if I can take it just one step further, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Judgment is coming upon those who do not know the who. And as a result did not do what he commanded. 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 7 says, Unto you her trouble rests with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Listen to this, verse 8. The Lord is coming back from heaven in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. There's the who. And that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's the do. Judgment's coming on those who do not know the Lord as their Savior and that did not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I simply ask before I go any further, do you know God? I'm not asking, do you know about God? God has taught for you in this pulpit every Sabbath, every meeting. But I'm asking, do you know God by experience of the new birth? And knowing God by the new birth, are you obeying his word and his will for your life? You know, there's a constraint here. There's his constraint. Pharaoh issues a false charge that the people had been idle from their labors when the very opposite had been the case. Verse 4, King of Egypt said unto them, Wherefore do ye, Moses and Aaron, let the people from their works get you unto your burdens? And what follows is orders that their work be increased in that they had to go and they had to find the straw in the making of the bricks. Verse 7, Ye shall no more give the people straw to make brick as heretofore. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. In those days, the straw was mixed with the steel, or, or sorry, with the clay in order to strengthen the brick. Uh, I use the word steeler because today we would have concrete that's strengthened by steel. Well, in those days, straw had the purpose. And so the, the clay was taken and the straw was, was brought and there was a mixing uh, and the making of the brick to give that strength. And this request now meant a greater workload for the people. And what it all amounts to is Pharaoh's rejection of God. I'm not letting your Israel's people go. I'm not letting God's people go. I'm giving them a greater workload. And the more men reject God, then the more cruelty will be seen in society. Are we not seeing that today where we have abortion? Right up to birth. Where we have assault and abuse in every hand. Because there's men who have rejected God and it's wholesale 
And there's more cruelty now in society than there ever was. But just think of the purpose of this constraining order. No doubt it was designed to put fear into their hearts, to prevent them ever making such a request again for worship. They'll not dare and come bring another request like this because I'm going to get, add to their work. They've got to gather the straw. They've got to make the same tail of bricks. They've got to make the same number of bricks as heretofore. So it'll be a, an incentive for them not to ask again. But subtly, Pharaoh was engaged in something else here. He's engaged in the tactics of the devil. For by this increased workload, he was filling their hours. He was filling their lives. And so full that they wouldn't have had time to think of any worship, never mind engage in it or go three days hence to it. And men and women, is that not a tactic of the devil to this day that we need to be discerning of? We have all the technology. I started my message with that word. But yet how busy people are. And they haven't time for anything. And the workplace is there and there's so much to do and there's little time to do it. And the squeezing of it in. And so what happens is I have no me time. I have little time for the family. I've reduced time for the other matters of life in the home. And so we'll do those things on another day. We'll push it back. We'll cut the lawn on the Sunday. We'll wash the car on the Sunday. We hadn't time to do it on the Saturday. What happens? The worship of God is gone by default. It's a tactic of the devil. How is your schedule? in terms of having time for God in the quiet place. And listen, I, I preach to myself because the little quiet time can go by default with all these other things and demands in life. How is your schedule a meeting with the Lord? How is your schedule with a meeting of worship corporately as a congregation? I simply say this, men and women, be careful of the tactics of the devil. Everything now is pushed on to the Sunday. The cycle is doing their runs on the Sunday. The grass, the car, the shopping malls. No time for worship. The refusal is noted as I close this morning in his contempt. Look at the words of verse 9 with me, please. Let their more work be laid upon the men that they may labor therein, and let them not regard vain words. Vain words is how Pharaoh described the language and the request of Moses and Aaron for worship. Pharaoh's attitude about the worship of God is reflected in many high and in many mighty figures today. For they're often seen to be void of wisdom when it comes to the most important things of life. That stuff, that's just vain. I trust when it comes to the things of God, I trust when it comes to the things of the Lord Jesus Christ and of God's salvation, of eternal matters, that you are not so foolish to reject them as just being empty and meaningless. Because that's what being means. For what it meant in the councils of the Godhead in eternity past was that one day God the Son became man so that he might lay down his life on an old Roman gibbet there upon Golgotha's brow. And he did so bearing away the sins of his people in his own body so that they might be set free from the bondage of their sin, from the punishment of their sin in a lost eternity forever. And I don't see or I don't consider anything to be vain in that. Rather, I would have to say that is something most wonderful for he died and he rose again for an old wretch of a sinner such as I. That's not vain. That's marvelous. 
Dear loved one, maybe you're not saved. I'm preaching this morning to one who's not saved. Please don't refuse God's offer of mercy any longer. But come even now and be saved. The battle's going on in your heart. May Christ, may God have the victory today, now. The Lord bless his word to each of our hearts for his own name's sake. Number 100 will change their position as we close this morning. Page 216, O Christ, what burdens by thy head our Lord was laid on thee. I stoodest in the sinner's stead that's bear all ill for me. We'll sing verses 1, 3, and 5. 1, 3, and 5 of number 100. Stand in the sight. Father and our God, we thank Thee for Thy presence with us. We bless Thee for this portion of Scripture that we've been looking at in the battle for worship. And, O oh God, we recognize that battle still continues to this day. Uh, Lord, we recognize there are even the tactics of the devil abroad. And, Lord, we pray that we might search our own hearts and that our worship might be acceptable with Thee. We would not come, Lord, with a complacent spirit, an unprepared heart, but, oh, that we might come with that joy of the Lord in our hearts and our souls, rendering that which is comely unto God. And, Lord, that our worship might be guarded, even from the encroaching things of this life. And we pray that, Lord, it might be acceptable with thee. We pray, Lord, for the unseen, oh, that they might merely not go through the form of some religious exercise and go out home saying, I've done my bit. But, oh, Father, we pray that they might desire to know God. And we can only know God through the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. And we pray, Lord, that thou would give that deciding grace, give the gift of faith even this morning, that a soul, a loved one, may close in with thine offer of mercy. Part us with thy fear and in thy blessing. Give us a good Sabbath, Lord. Bring us back again, and I will tonight. We pray in our Savior's precious name. Amen.